Um, but yeah, as you might see from the title slide, this is not going to be like the other talks here. Um, but I hope that I nevertheless can get you interested in what we're doing. And also, uh, I've sort of minimized the amount of experimental stuff. There will be some experimental results in here, but there will also be a bit of theory. So you won't go too much out of your comfort zone, I promise. Um, now, uh, as you can see from the title, um, we are uh, studying a system uh, which is comprised of a, a one-dimensional Bose gas. And revolving around this Bose gas, these are sort of the main points I, I want to sort of emphasize today uh, and what I will sort of be going through. So firstly, uh, when you confine such a Bose gas to a single dimension, uh, a lot of interesting stuff happens. For instance, uh, regardless of uh, the actual coupling strength between the atoms, the system itself becomes intrinsically strongly interacting, and it has some really interesting consequences that I will go over. Um, next, I will also be discussing how we actually realize such low dimensional systems, particular one dimensional systems, uh, in an experiment. Uh, some of the uh, difficulties in doing that, and uh, some of the consequences there are. And lastly, I will show you, or hopefully convince you, that uh, fluid dynamics or hydrodynamics can offer a really uh, powerful description of these experimental systems, uh, not just in terms of accurately uh, sort of giving us the results that we see, uh, describing the experimental observations, but also in terms of interpretability of these results. Um, so first of all, why, why do we even do 1D physics to begin with? And um, besides, I mean, being in one dimension is nice. Uh, if you want to do calculations or simulations, right, because it reduces the complexity, it's a lot simpler system to work with. However, there are also some really, there's some really interesting physics going on in one dimension, which is due to the fact that the system is one dimensional. So for instance, if you consider uh, a, 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 a gas of bosons that have contact interaction, and they're in three dimension, and they're sort of a dilute gas, you can imagine you create sort of an excitation in the terms of a single particle moving throughout the system. And yeah, if this gas is dilute enough, you can easily imagine this particle just passing through the entire system without interacting with any other particles. Now, if you go to 1D, the situation becomes very different, right? Because no matter what uh, atom I will excite here, it will at some point uh, interact with another particle, which will then interact with another particle and another particle. Uh, and the result is that uh, all the excitations in 1D have a collective nature. Now, when we go to uh, this 1D Bose gas, the model that we're working with is called the Lieblinger model, which has this uh, simple uh, expression here. So you just have your kinetic term, and you have some contact interaction. Now, uh, this, this model features a lot of, lot of interesting, uh, it has a lot of interesting features. For instance, um, it has an infinite number uh, of conserved quantities, or an infinite number of conservation laws. And this severely restricts the dynamics of the system to such a degree that the system actually does not thermalize. This was demonstrated uh, in the seminal quantum Newton's cradle experiment, where you have a Bose gas in one day, um, which is in a harmonic confinement. And you then imp uh, do what is called a Bragg pulse sequence, where you impart two large opposite momenta on this cloud. So this is in the uh, momentum space. So this is like the initial state. You have sort of two, the two what we call black Bragg peaks, which are then uh, these two large opposite momentum states. And these, uh, what will then happen is that the cloud is going to split apart due to these two large opposite momenta and then start oscillating in the harmonic confinement. And sort of every half period, it will, uh, it will collide in the center of the trap. Uh, like the two clouds will collide by themselves. And if you're just going to imagine like a regular sort of gas with a bunch of particles and they're colliding, you would imagine just a huge redistribution of all the momenta and a rapid thermalization of the system. However, because it has to abide to this infinite set of conservation laws, you will actually see this motion continuing basically indefinitely. And indeed, that's also why the experiment is called the quantum Newton's cradle, because it's similar to this toy, right, where you have like the beads hanging from strings and you pull one up and then it sort of goes to side to side. It's basically the same as going on here, just with a, a gas 
of bosons uh, restricted to a 1D geometry. Now, um, we want to describe what is going on in these systems, and we want to be able to describe the dynamics. Uh, and uh, for many years, this has been very challenging until sort of recently. And uh, to be able to describe like the theory that has emerged, which allows us to describe these dynamics, uh, first of all, relies on the fact that uh, this mo model is what is called integrable. Uh, and it's usually just a term uh, sort of in, in, in the community that we use to sort of say that it has all these properties, that it has these uh, conserved quantities, it doesn't have formalized, and uh, then we can actually have exact solutions of the eigenstates of this model in terms of, in terms of collective quasi-particle excitations. Now, the second component to then, this, this will then give us sort of the, the static properties of the system. But to really go to dynamics, uh, this theory of hydrodynamics came up about six years ago. And uh, to, to really get to hydrodynamics, the uh, central argument is that of separation of scales. So on sort of the macroscopic scale, you imagine your system to have uh, slow variations in space and time, whereas uh, on the microscopic level, you can then have much, much faster processes compared to, to the macroscopic level. Now, what that means is uh, on sort of the method, met mesoscopic intermediate scale, um, you can imagine uh, the system actually to, to relax, locally relax to a maximum entropy state. You can sort of imagine uh, the rest of the system acting as a sort of a bath and any sort of uh, inhomogeneity here uh, and, uh, and dynamics is going to be so much slower than the microscopic dynamics, so you can always establish sort of a local uh, stationary state. And uh, this local stationary state, thanks to the integrability of the system, we can then describe, we can describe its thermodynamic properties using what is called the thermodynamic beta ansatz. And uh, in short, what the thermodynamic beta ansatz, what you do here is that you describe the system in terms of the collective quasi-particles, and uh, in the thermodynamic limit, you then have sort of a distribution of these quasi-particles, which are then characterized by the momentum called the rapidity. Now, uh, for a long time, this sort of rapidity uh, was sort of thought of as a bookkeeping trick to just do the theory. However, actually recently, there have been experiments measuring this because it can be interpreted as sort of the asymptotic momenta of the atoms, or sort of the momenta of atoms in between collision events. Um, another very important property is that these quasi-particles are actually fermionic. So even though we have a purely bosonic system that might even be weakly interacting, the uh, quasi-particles, the excitations, actually behave fermionically. And this is a reflection of this, this point on, on my first slide, that uh, even though uh, coupling strength might be weak, the nature of the system is that of a strongly interacting system. And this is manifested in terms of these fermionic statistics. Now, what we then do for hydrodynamics is we say, okay, we have sort of our, what we call a fluid cell here, and it's described, uh, its fermionic state is then characterized by this distribution of quasi-particles. And we can then imagine a, a neighboring fluid cell which is described by a slightly different distribution, and again, a slightly distribu different distribution in the, in the next cell. Um, and the result is that this uh, distribution of quasi particles then becomes both time and space dependent, and we can write sort of a general conservation equation for this, uh, for the quasi particles. Now, this is sort of a very standard hydrodynamic argument. Uh, the trick here, uh, uh, which was the main challenge in developing uh, this theory of generalized hydrodynamics, was to identify uh, what is actually the velocity, the propagation velocity of the quasi-particles. And uh, there are several different ways of doing this. Uh, to me, uh, there's like one very nice argument that you can make sort of a bit, bit hand wavy, but uh, kind of understandable. Um, if you imagine a bunch of, of particles here, and then moving throughout the system, these particles will be propagating 
according to their momentum, their rapidity, when they're sort of in between collisions. However, every time there's a collision, uh, something special happens. Because we're uh, in 1D, um, every time we have a, a scattering event, there's an associated scattering phase with it. And this phase can be interpreted as a delay of the particles. In a sense, if you imagine the two particles coming in and colliding, uh, if you look at sort of asymptotic uh, distances, it looks as if they emerge from this collision at a later point in time. And this delay is called the Wigner time delay, uh, depends then on the difference between their two uh, rapidities. So then, if you have your sort of tracer particle moving through a background density of other particles, you end up with this sort of effective velocity when you're summing over all these contributions. And you have sort of an, uh, the expression for it here. And this is of the, the group velocity, this is the propagation velocity of our tracer particle in between the collisions. And then as it's moving through this background density of uh, other quasi-particles, it then experiences uh, these Wigner time delays that add up, and then we end up with, with this total effective velocity. Yes. So a quasi-particle is uh, a collective excitation of the system. Uh, it constitutes uh, an eigenstate, basically the eigenstates of the uh, Lieblinica Hamiltonian are built up, like you, the solutions you can write in terms of these quasi-particles. And then the step here, the hydrodynamic step, is then actually showing that instead of doing hydrodynamics with the atoms, the individual atoms of our system, we're instead doing hydrodynamics with now the collective excitations. Um, so that's the main step. Thank you. Um, so just to summarize, so this, these were two Holmite papers in 2016, which then, uh, which came up with this uh, hydrodynamic theory. So just, just to recap, uh, very importantly, it's, uh, as any hydrodynamic theory, it's a coarse grain theory. So we've sort of thrown away all the microscopic information of the system and instead we're just looking at coarse-grained sort of macroscopic properties instead. Um, now, this of course means that there are also several limitations uh, to what, what you actually can describe with this sort of system or this model. However, uh, it is actually particularly well suited for experiments because in cold gas experiments, the way we typically measure properties of our system, the way we, we interact with our system is through imaging. We basically take pictures of our gas to gain, to, to measure, say, the density of it. And when you take a picture, right, your, uh, your camera is also discretized in terms of the pixels. And there's a point spread function, there's a limited resolution and everything. So whenever you interact with your system in an experiment, you're sort of also doing a coarse graining. So in that sense, uh, hydrodynamics works very well uh, to sort of, it, it essentially discards all the information we don't see anyways in the experiment. But it's still there in the underlying theory is just used to obtain, say, these effective properties like the effective velocity and whatnot. Now, because we are, uh, because we assume that we have sort of a local stationary state at all points in time and space, we can just use the whole framework of the thermodynamic beta ansatz then to extract, say, uh, thermodynamic expectation values. So if we have this time-dependent uh, quasi-particle distribution now, uh, we can just get the, uh, the density, for example, by averaging or uh, integrating over rapidity. So this whole thing considered a, a one-dimensional system, but in, in the experimental system, you are not always 1D. Actually, rarely you're perfectly 1D. Uh, so what we want to see is how well does it describe uh, an experimental system, which where, where 1D the condition of 1D might be broken slightly. Um, and, and first I would like to just explain how we even get to 1D in the experiment to begin with. Um, so there are two main platforms that are typically used, uh, either optical lattices or atom chips. So in an optical lattice, you have sort of two counter-propagating laser beams and their interference pattern makes sort of like a, an, an X-ray where you have uh, then these, uh, this Bose gas so you get these very uh, sort of highly elongated Bose gases. Um, the upside of having a, an optical lattice is that uh, 
I would say the tightness of the trap, the, the transfer tightness depends on the intensity of the lasers. So you have really powerful lasers, you can create a very good 1D system. The downside is, however, that you have a lot of them. Typically, you don't just have one system, you have multiple, and they might differ slightly. Uh, so you end up with something like ensemble averaging, which is not so nice. Alternatively, you can have what's called an atom chip, uh, which is what we have in our setup, um, which then uses magnetic fields uh, generated by these microfabricated wires on this sort of gold chip structure to produce some very uh, high gradient magnetic fields, uh, which then creates uh, a, like a trap where we then have the system, the pools of gas. But uh, common for both of them is that you get this highly elongated pools of gas. And for this, uh, this gas to be considered 1D, uh, the main condition is basically that we say that uh, all the motion in the transverse direction is completely frozen out. Now, the way that you, sort of the rule of thumb, and you say you typically have achieved this, is if your system is completely confined to the ground state of your transverse trap. So if you say we have a, a then sort of, you have your, like your weak longitudinal trap, the long axis of the gas, and then you have the tight sort of transverse trap. And this will always, always be, almost always be um, sort of parabolic. And if it's then restricted to the ground state, uh, which happens with all the internal energy scales, say the uh, chemical potential and thermal energy, is much smaller than the transverse level spacing, then it's a good rule of thumb that your system is 1D. However, I will show you that there are exceptions to this. Um, now we can um, relax this criteria a little bit and go to what is called a, a quasi-1D system. And in a quasi-1D system, uh, we then allow some transverse motion to occur. And then this is typically what will happen in the experiment because you might have atoms where you have two atoms that have high, uh, large opposite momenta. And if they collide, they might have enough collision energy to actually exceed uh, the transverse level spacing, and then you can create excitations. Um, so you might have some transverse motion going on. However, as long as uh, all the relevant uh, transverse states remain sort of one-dimensional in character, then we say that there, the system is, is quasi-1D. It's sort of in the crossover between 1D and 3D. Now, to really have a three-dimensional system would be, then be if uh, exactly if, this, if the system behaves fully three-dimensional in the sense that uh, the 3D excitations also have sort of collective behavior just as they have in 1D. Then you need like a full boogaloo of treatment in, in 3D to, to describe it. Um, and now, if you then remember uh, like at the start, uh, when I started with the hydrodynamics, one of the criteria was this thing called integrability where you have an infinite set of uh, conservation laws. However, if you have these transverse excitations, they break some of these conservation laws. They break integrability, at least weakly. And we actually tested this by realizing such a, a quantum Newton's cradle ourselves. Um, and there, what we did was we took this, these Bragg pulses that uh, would excite the two large opposite momenta, and we tuned it to just be such a kinetic energy that we imparted was very, very close to the transverse level spacing. So basically, a lot of atoms, uh, or some atoms, will have enough kinetic energy to create such transverse excitations. And what you see over time, that in the beginning, uh, we still have this nice oscillation uh, of the two Bragg peaks. However, once we go up to uh, in the order of 50, 60, 70 periods, oscillation periods, of this cradle, you see that we start uh, looking at, like we sort of lose these Bragg peaks and we start seeing these central momenta, this is again momentum space, uh, uh, sort of low momenta becoming occupied. And this is basically because uh, some of this uh, kinetic energy is turned into potential energy when we're creating transverse excitations. And it breaks integrability and allows the system eventually to thermalize. It's, well, first of all, it's because, first of all, that when they pass through each other, it's a relatively 
sort of short interaction time, right? Uh, so the, the, it, they pass through each other like 70 times or something, which is not necessarily so much. And secondly, we tune it such that um, we're basically on the edge here. So they are only actually, even though um, there might be like a couple of hundred atoms here oscillating, uh, the amount of atoms that can actually partake in these transverse excitations is more in the order of maybe 3% of the total amount of atoms. So if we really tune it just to the edge, if we tune it higher, then we see a much, much faster relaxation. So is there a way that we can then extend this generalized hydrodynamics to uh, the quasi-1D regime? And uh, indeed there is. Uh, what we came up with is this sort of multi-component Lieblinger model, uh, where in addition to carrying this rapidity, each quasi-particles also carry a, a pseudo-spin. Um, and all these quasi-particles still share the same distribution of, of rapidities. And this is uh, exactly a signature of this quasi-1D, in the sense that the system is still 1D in character. It still shares this 1D momentum, which is tag on a different degree, an additional degree of freedom through this uh, pseudo-spin. And what happens then is, uh, first of all, I added a, a potential to the equation, but also you end up with uh, what is called like a, a Boltzmann collision integral. And this is basically a sum over, you have to sum over all the different collision channels. In our system, this constitutes, you can have two atoms colliding and then exciting both to the first excited, two atoms in the ground state and then two to the first excited, or two atoms in the ground state and then one to the second excited due to, to parity. Or you can also have the reverse, so you have one atom in the ground state that collides with one in the second excited state, and then you have a de excitation. You basically have to sum over all these different collision channels, and you get the total Boltzmann collision integral. And the, the pseudo spin. So the effective velocity depends on the rapidity. So the rapidity, you can say, it characterizes the, the quasi particle, it labels the quasi particle. And then the effective velocity is then exactly the, the rapidity plus uh, a correction from all these uh, Buechner time delays. Hmm. No, so as, as, as an important point here is because our transverse trap is actually symmetric uh, and harmonic, every single excited state will have sort of the same coupling constant. And what that means is that you can uh, basically do this treatment where exactly in, in the 1D direction, the, the system still behaves exactly the same way as it did before. However, uh, we just have the pseudo spin label attached to the quasi particles in addition. And we then account for the transverse motion through this extra term that we add. And this extra term will then sort of break the integrability and allow redistribution of rapidities that was normally not allowed. Now, I'll show you just like quickly, like these, these Boltzmann collision integrals usually have kind of nasty, uh, they're quite long, but uh, I can show sort of the general structure of how they build up. So if you imagine two, these are our two Bragg peaks. So this is our distribution of quasi particles now two Bragg peaks, and we have two atoms or two particles with large opposite momenta that collide. Um, the way that we can sort of uh, model that uh, when they then get excited to the first excited state is that we create two holes. We basically remove the particles from this quasi-particle distribution and we add them back in at their new much lower momenta. And this is sort of reflected in the structure of the uh, collision integral, we have some probability for this collision event to happen. And then we have basically uh, creating the, these holes at our incoming rapidities and removing the particles, and likewise creating the particles again now at the outgoing scattering rapidities. Um, and if we then compare <coughs> 
these two uh, types of, of GHD, uh, the fully 1D one and then the quasi 1D one. Um, for this case as a constant using cradle, we get the following. So this is like the full sort of phase space with rapidity and, and real space. And then when they're oscillating in this harmonic confinement, it is basically a rotation in the phase space. And if you just look at the fully 1D dynamics, then you can see these Bragg peaks being clearly separated up to very, very long time scales. This is about 100 periods of the cradle. And as you can see, it is definitely not thermal. However, if we add this uh, Boltzmann collision integral, then we can scatter uh, particles into low rapidity states. And over time, it enables thermalization of the system. So, and this is indeed, if we compare more quantitatively with the experiment, uh, we sort of quant uh, quantize the, uh, the thermalization as being like the average uh, momentum distribution over a period. And in the beginning, it looks a bit weird because this is momentum distribution, this is rapidity distribution, so they don't really fit. But as the system becomes non-degenerate, the two overlap, and you actually see that we have a good agreement with the experiment. And uh, more impressively, uh, actually, the, uh, these are these pseudo spins. I didn't really show them before, but they're basically the probability of being in a transverse excited states. And uh, our model actually agrees quite well with the uh, experimental results. So except at, at long times, we probably underestimated the, the heating of the system. But otherwise, the collision model really describes well what is actually going on in our system. Now, through sort of what I've been talking about so far, uh, there are all the components of what would become uh, quite an, an interesting phenomena because, uh, as I said before, these quasi-particles are actually fermionic. And up until now, we've been looking at the case of the quantum Newton cradle where we have these two uh, large opposite rapidity clouds colliding with one another and then scattering into these low rapidity states in the center. Uh, what happens if we then fill up all these states? We fill them up completely, then by virtue of the fermionic statistics, we should be able to essentially create a Pauli blocking of these transverse excitations. Um, so basically the way we go that, about that is if you imagine this, uh, also particle distribution, now with a lot of particles at low momentum. What I then didn't really mention before is we, you can't just occupy any rapidity. There are only certain rapidities that are allowed due to uh, boundary conditions and symmetries, essentially. Um, so you have a density of states that is essentially the sum of uh, the density of particles and the density of holes. And if we fill up all the low momentum states, then at low rapidities, we essentially realize a Fermi C of these quasi-particles. Now, if you imagine this uh, transverse excitations uh, from earlier, where you have two sort of high rapidity uh, particles coming in and want to create a transverse excitation, now the states they want to scatter in are completely filled and it's actually not even possible to do it because the density of holes out here is zero. There are no holes available. It basically comes, uh, it reflects this sort of strongly interacting nature of the 1D Bose gas, and it basically just comes out of the beta ansatz equations. Uh, I, besides that, there's not like, an intuitive uh, answer to it, uh, it, it basically just follow, falls out of the equations. You can see if you, if you, if you take the coplic constant, the coplic constant between the atoms, and you crank it all the way up, then the bosons become uh, what we call hardcore bosons, and they behave as free, free fermions, essentially. However, their collective degree of freedom, regardless of the coplic constant, or it's still fermionic, and that just comes out of the, the beta ansatz. Now, um, 
we wanted to see if we could actually realize this setup uh, experimentally. So this is sort of our setup. We have our, our shiny vacuum chambers in here. And this, yeah, up, up here you see our Atom chip, this gold chip. And we have our virus structure and then uh, our cloud of uh, bosons is then suspended below the chip. We have about 6,000 atoms uh, which are weakly interacting. And then by tuning our cooling, we can realize uh, temperatures in the range of half the transverse level spacing all the way up to about three times the transverse level spacing. So what would normally be considered deep into the quasi-1D regime, almost going on to fully 3D. And then we have what is called a DMD, which is a digital micromirror device. Uh, it's basically what is inside every projector. It's an array of tiny, tiny mirrors that can be toggled on or off. And what we do is we shine a laser beam onto this array, and then by toggling these mirrors on and off, we can shape the beam front of our laser and essentially create a, a beam of a, an arbitrary shape. And then it's thereby creating an arbitrary uh, dipole trap on our, on our cloud. So we can basically paint in any 1D potential that we wish. Now this leads to a lot of flexibility in our system. And mainly what we do is the following. We take our 1D gas and we use our DMD to imprint two hard walls on either side, essentially realizing a box trap. And then in the bottom of this box trap, we do like a sinusoidal uh, modulation. And we can then control sort of what we call the quench amplitude by how big the amplitude is of this, uh, this modulation. This would be the potential, and imagine this as sort of uh, a, a sort of chemical potential to put its colors in here. And we can also control the, the temperature or the atom number of our gas in general. And then what we can do is we can then quench to a setup where we have just a flat bottom trap, so a, a box trap, and we then see how this perturbation that we imprinted evolves uh, and relaxes over time. In particular, we're then interested in the dynamics of this perturbation that we imprint. If you look at sort of the, uh, the density and we subtract sort of the uh, density average over time, so this is basically just the asymptotic density, the flat density here, then we get sort of the perturbation, and we're gonna um, essentially uh, represent that in terms of sort of cosine modes. We're interested in, in the evolution of, like we want to address essentially a single mode and see how it evolves. And what is important about this quench is that unlike the quantum Newton cradle where you really did this violent Bragg pulse excitation where you excite to two large opposite momenta, this is way more gentle so we actually want to preserve this Fermi C at low rapidities. Uh, so that's why we're, we're, not, we're not sort of splitting the gas completely. We're just writing in a small-ish perturbation. And if we look at some data from here, uh, this is sort of the dynamics of the perturbation. The dashed lines are sort of the walls, uh, the hard walls that we imprint. And as you can see, uh, we have very nice long-lived uh, dynamics and very well resolved uh, oscillations of this perturbation that we write into our gas. And if we do this uh, cosine mode decomposition, you can also see that we indeed excite basically a single mode with our quench. Now if we take this one mode out and isolate it, and sort of plot the evolution, uh, we actually see that it has quite remarkable agreement with the GHD simulations. I want to stress this is not a fit this is just, this is a simulation where we uh, verify the temperature and atom number with separate measurements beforehand. Just plug those parameters into the simulation, we run it, and then we get this curve. Now, this was for a relatively small temperature and relatively small sort of quench amplitude. But if we now go up to high temperature, we see a faster relaxation of the system. But GHD still provides a really good description. And also if we increase the amplitude, we again see a very good description. Now, I want you to pay attention to uh, the temperature scale here because we're almost at twice the transverse level spacing. 
uh, from my slide a uh, bit before, this would be quite deep into this quasi 1D regime. However, our 1D theory clearly still describes our system very well. And indeed, if we also do the quasi 1D theory that we just developed earlier, you see that it basically produces exactly the same results. And the reason is indeed this uh, emergent Pauli blocking. Essentially, this collision integral just vanishes because our density of holes at low rapidity states is zero. So, yeah, exactly. We're, so we're basically, uh, we basically realize a system that behaves like a full 1D system, even though we're deep into the, uh, like physically, we're deep in the crossover between one and three dimensions. But the system is completely 1D in nature, just because we've frozen out the transverse motion by, by, yeah, by this Pauli blocking mechanism, even though it's a bosonic gas. And we then sort of fit the, uh, the dynamics with sort of a, a damped uh, oscillation. And you can see for uh, a wide uh, like range of temperatures and uh, quench amplitudes, the 1D theory and the quasi 1D theory basically completely agree. It's only when you really get to about three times the transverse uh, level spacing in terms of thermal energy that the two start to diverge. And uh, for reference, this blue line here is where we sort of artificially remove the fermionic statistics from the collision integral. Um, essentially, it's the same. We don't need the density of holes. We just replace it by the density of states. We just assume that all states are not, like all the low rapidity states are not filled. And what happens when we do this is just by virtue of our high chemical potential alone, we don't even need the temperature just by the, the virtue of the high chemical potential, the system immediately thermalizes because we're so deep into this quasi 1D regime. Uh, but I mean, you can clearly see there's a huge difference between accounting for the fermionic statistics of the excitations and not doing it. And indeed, our experiment clearly follows the, the fermionic statistics. Um, so how does the system relax? Now, I don't have a much, lot of time now, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm gonna blast through this real quick. So how does it actually relax? So clearly the system behaves as a 1D system, uh, but um, so it must be some 1D mechanism that is causing it to relax. And we know it cannot be thermalization because thermalization is forbidden in the generalized high dynamics. It was what was on the first slide basically. So uh, what is it? Now, it is actually a defacing mechanism. So if we introduce what is we call the filling function or the Fermi factor, it is basically the ratio of quasi particles, uh, uh, quasi particle density over the density of states. So in the Fermi C, this is one when you filled up all the states, and zero if there you have no particles essentially. And the ground state is then just a Fermi C, a hard Fermi C with some Fermi momentum. And then as we go to a higher temperature, we develop these long tails. Now, what we can do is we can say, we can then re linearize the equation of motion around some uh, stationary background. So if you remember the setup, because we're riding in a small perturbation, we can basically treat this uh, filling function, which by the way is an equivalent description of the system to the um, uh, particle density. And we write it as some, some background plus some perturbation. And we just say that our perturbation that we then write in is a single mode. Then what we end up with is the simple uh, evolution equation for a single rapidity component essentially. So here we basically take our, uh, the, for example, if we take the, uh, the plot here, this is basically this filling function where we subtracted this background. So you can see our perturbation sort of lives not at the inner rapidities, but at sort of the, the more outer rapidities. And I've selected a few sort of points here, select rapidities, and plotted their evolution according to this equation. And as you can see, because the effective velocity is a monotonically increasing function of the rapidity, 
each of these components is going to evolve at a slightly different rate. And over time, they deface with respect to one another. And this is what leads us to this apparent relaxation of, uh, of the density mode that we imprinted. You would essentially expect a revival. That you, you probably have to wait a very, very, very long time. And then any uh, weak integrability breaking would mess this up. But in a perfect 1D system, indeed, you would expect some revival after some time, yeah. Uh, and essentially, because uh, when you have higher temperature, this sort of uh, thermal tail that develop is much larger. It means that there's a larger spread in rapidity, which again means that they deface faster with respect to one another compared to the cold case. And this is why we see that, why we observe that our, our relaxation is faster with higher temperature, simply because that this spread of rapidities that we occupy is larger. Now, we wanted to also try this, uh, try to understand this in terms of effective field theories. So, um, something we also often look at in the experiment are fluctuations. And we can sort of interpret this picture with the, uh, with the rapidities uh, a little bit in terms of uh, thermal fluctuations. So if we look at sort of the second quantized version of the Hamiltonian, we can write it in this uh, phase density representation where we have a phase operator and some density, where we have a density fluctuations here. And we can introduce something we call a boost which is the phase gradient, which is essentially like a velocity. And what we then look at are sort of thermal fluctuations then of the density and the phase, uh, which for low enough temperatures are, are Gaussian. And we treat these fluctuations then as bosonic quasi-particles, not to be confused with the previous quasi-particles, we now label these as boostons because of this sort of boost here. And in the hydrodynamic picture, uh, this basically equates to having our uh, zero temperature state, which is this uh, Fermi C, and then we have some fluctuations, local fluctuations of this Fermi H, uh, which follow then from the fluctuations in density and boost. And indeed, if we then sample many, many, many of these boostons and average over them, even though they are bosonic quasi-particles, once you do this averaging, we actually obtain, again, the fermionic distributions of the beta ansatz quasi-particles, showing us as this sort of, as this, uh, an equivalence between these two different principles. And we can go even further, we can also try to treat uh, dynamics. Essentially, if you have your zero temperature system, uh, you typically see propagation in terms of a sound velocity, which in the hydrodynamic sense is just this effective velocity uh, at the Fermi edge or zero temperature state. So what we can do is we can basically create a bunch of zero temperature states, uh, beta ansatz states that have like locally shifted uh, Fermi momenta due to these fluctuations, these thermal fluctuations and we can then propagate them according to the GHD hydrodynamic uh, equations. So this is basically the propagation equation for just this filling factor. And here is a propagation uh, equation for a, what we call the Fermi contour, which is just the time and space dependent Fermi edge or Fermi momentum. And we then propagate many, many, many of these realizations and average over them. So what you see in red here is basically, uh, so this was sort of the, the lowest mode. This is the second lowest mode. Uh, here in red, you basically have uh, this filling function, which is sort of a smooth function, as you can see, like here. And then you have these uh, hard, basically, uh, Fermi contours, where you can see some of the same overall structure, but there's a lot of fluctuation in there. And we're basically propagating these, we're propagating the, the red sort of distribution according to this equation, and we're propagating these contours according to this equation. And then we average over them. And what we see is um, here, I'm basically pl uh, plotting then the evolution of the Bogolivov mode operators, which you can just uh, 
these are the, the mode functions that are important, but they basically come out of the uh, density fluctuations and, and the phase. And this is the same scenario again where we imprint this sort of uh, density mode and then quench to the flat box. You can see there's sort of a coherent population of the density quadrature here. And then there's sort of a Gaussian distribution as well. So this is this, these Gaussian fluctuations in density and phase, and then a coherent excitation due to this mode that we're writing in. And this is then evolving in this sort of phase space. And um, if we take all these, diff each of these dots then represent a single realization of our system of this ground state plus the boost on excitations. And if we then average over all of these, uh, which is a black line, and we compare with GHD, which is the normal GHD, which is uh, the red dotted line, we see a very, very good agreement between the two. Um, you can basically um, then picture this defacing that happens exactly through the, the distribution of now sound velocities. Essentially, the sound velocity in a quasar condensate is given by this equation plus then this, this boost that we're putting in, this phase that we're putting in. Um, and because our density is now fluctuating uh, and has some, some distribution um, with this variance, actually, it's a Gaussian distribution with this variance, and our boost is also uh, a Gaussian distribution with some variance, then in total, our uh, sound velocities will follow a Gaussian distribution with some variance. And because you will have different sound velocities, over time, these different sort of sound modes or fluid modes are going to deface with respect to one another. And you're gonna end up seeing the, the defacing and the relaxation. So these two pictures here are essentially equivalent. So you can either interpret it in terms of uh, an effective field theory approach uh, with this sort of hydrodynamic evolution or straight up this linearized hydrodynamics. Um, so yeah, to recap, um, we've seen that the 1D Bose gas behaves intrinsically strongly interacting through these uh, fermionic statistics of the collective excitations, which we observed in the experiment uh, through this essentially Pauli blocking mechanism, allowing us to stay 1D in a regime where we have nowhere, uh, where we definitely should not be 1D otherwise. Um, then we've seen how we can realize quasi-1D and 1D systems uh, in experiment by exactly transversely, tightly transversely confining our gas using either magnetic or optical traps. And you see that uh, this hydrodynamic theory uh, provides a really powerful description of our of our system, both in terms of the fact that it describes our experimental observations really well, but also that it is flexible enough to allow these interpretations, both in terms of the transverse excitations and in terms of these effective field theory models. Um, and yes, thank you very much. <laughs>